an out-of-this-world theory on how nothing turned into something, a giant fossil human footprint, and we dive into the mailbox. This is Genesis Week. And a welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins Controversy exclusive right here on YouTube. Still one of the most discussed videos on YouTube in science and technology. We bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and we show the glory of God in creation. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace... Just punch in Wazulu.com or GenesisWeek.com and you will find us, or click the ever-so-convenient subscribe link up top. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Alan Boyle of Cosmic Log on MSNBC had an interview with theoretical physicist Lawrence Krauss. Krauss is the head of the Origins Project at Arizona State University and tackled the question of how did everything come from nothing in his latest book entitled A Universe from Nothing. So... How exactly do you get a universe from nothing? Well, as Boyle explained it, by calling upon energy to be converted into matter following the suit of Einstein's relativistic theory, combined with a countless succession of big bangs creating many universes and different parameters and laws of physics. That's right, it can work if we violate the laws of physics. Translation, it would be a miracle. Now, I admire Krauss's brutal honesty. I mean, we creationists have been pointing out for decades that the origin of the universe and life requires a miracle, a defiance of the laws of nature and physics. But notice that while they are willing to accept a miracle, they will not accept the possibility of a miracle worker, our creator, Jesus Christ. Krauss said, It sounds like a scam. It isn't a scam. Once you allow gravity, the amazing thing is that you can start out with zero energy and end up with lots of stuff. And that stuff can have positive energy. As long as you counteract it with negative energy. Gravity allows energy to be negative. I liken it to the difference between a very savvy stockbroker and an embezzler. The savvy stockbroker will buy on margin and buy more stuff than they actually have money to account for. But as long as the stock goes up and they sell it to the end... No one knows the difference and everyone's happy. Whereas the embezzler takes the money and of course is discovered. The universe is more like the savvy stockbroker. <laughs> wow. <laughs> one comment on the blog left by United States 1776 summed up this utter nonsense nicely. I am possible, therefore I will be. <laughs> Krauss has envisioned a very introspective universe that needs to plan ahead in order to even be. Now forget about, I think, therefore I am. This is, I will be, therefore I must think of how I can be so I can think. Krauss defended his position by saying, my goal is not to destroy religion, though in fact that would be an interesting side effect. My goal is to use the hook of this fascinating question, which everyone asks, to motivate people to learn about the real universe. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> You were talking about a magical, mystical fantasy land where the laws of physics are different, or perhaps don't even exist. And now somehow you think this helps people learn about reality? Huh. Read, read the blog post yourself, then tell me what you think in the comments down below. Do you think Krauss is on to something? Or is he perhaps on something? Or do you think Krauss should be on something? In Jesus' Name's production is working on a movie that reenacts Noah's Flood. Producer Joe Bardwell invited both Christian Old Earth advocates and Young Earth Christians to present their models of how Noah's Flood happened or didn't happen in a peer-reviewed panel format. Joe then held a competition for 10 people in a technical review panel of which I earned a spot. Our job as the technical review panel was to rip these models apart scientifically if we could. Several Old Earth advocates declined to participate, but their models and arguments were scrutinized as non-responding authors. Six Young Earth creation models, both flood and pre-flood models, were defended by their authors in the technical review. 
The competition and technical review itself went on for some two years, and the findings of this review were published in a massive ebook. This is a must read for anyone interested in geology, flood geology, biblical catastrophism, uniformitarianism, actualism, etc. The book is available for instant download for a donation of your choosing. Now, if you could, please, I'd like to make a suggestion. Please make a generous donation as Joe put tens of thousands of dollars into this very important project. This book, in my opinion, is going to impact both the creation and evolution community as much as the landmark book, The Genesis Flood. You can get your copy here at In Jesus Names Production. This past week, Tino Gropi handed me a video of an alleged fossil human footprint found in South Africa. I shortly thereafter got bombarded with questions from viewers asking my opinion on this track. I was actually very grateful to see the video as Tino and I both belong to a discussion group about fossil footprints. And someone had posted some rather poor photos of this alleged track. Michael Tellinger uh, posted a video report of this odd feature in the rock and they did a splendid job showing the anomaly. I'm afraid to report, however, for multiple reasons, I do not believe this is a fossil human footprint. The footprint is in granite. Now, the conventional belief is that granite forms from a melt. If that is the case, then you have humans walking around leaving footprints in molten rock. Obviously, this is impossible. But even if the granite formed in a cold process, I still do not think it's a human footprint. For example, do watch the video yourself. Here's the link right here. Uh, where is the mud that was displaced by the foot making the footprint? You see, there isn't any. On a track that deep, there should be some, in fact, quite a bit. Secondly, I have personally investigated erosional features such as those that make up the toes in this track in multiple locations. It is caused by fracture and erosion, and in fact, several geologist friends and I were discussing how this could happen. In fact, in the video, you can see some other overhangs off to the left of the track in the rock face. They just do not bear any resemblance to toes or anything, but they are fracture and erosional features, just like you see in the footprint. A professor, Pieter Wagner, is quoted regarding the allegation of erosional features, saying, there is a higher probability of little green men arriving from space and licking it out with their tongues than being created by natural erosion. <sighs> with respect, Professor Wagner, as one of the leading fossil human footprint experts within the creation community, I get typically one to three requests per year to come investigate alleged fossil human footprints. Of all the investigations I have carried out, only one of them appeared to be genuine. All the others turned out to be footprint-shaped depressions, wave ripples, fractures, or erosion in the rock, including granite and gneiss. Some of them were, in fact, even more convincing than the South African feature. And you know what I've learned over the years? People get really, really angry when you tell them that their fossil foot human footprint isn't a fossil human footprint. The fact is that you can get so many shapes and depressions in rocks that you will get footprint impressions, human or otherwise. They are pseudo-fossils, and it is just for this reason that typically a dinosaur track is not considered genuine unless you have three tracks in a row, or other tracks in that immediate locality. The absence of a trail of human footprints in the South African site is also a major blow to the authenticity of this feature being a human footprint. So, while I must regrettably say, no, it is not a hit fossil human footprint, I must say, well done to Michael Tellinger on his report. Thank you. You did an excellent job of reporting this feature, showing video from afar off, as well as close in detail. This was much better documentation than I'd seen so, so far. Uh, so, I'm very grateful. Thanks for your hard work. Woohoo! Mail for me? Genesis Week has again found itself in the top 10 of the most discussed videos for the week in science and technology on YouTube. I got a barrage of emails from skeptics wanting me to cover thermodynamics on Genesis Week and claiming that because I hadn't covered it, my silence must be acknowledgement that I was wrong about what I said a few weeks back. Actually, if you recall, I said I was going to make a video dedicated to the subject. I'm still working on it. I'm producing this show weekly, which is a lot of work. I'm working on a book and I'm appearing on Creation Today program, so I've been swamped. So just be patient. Why? I've never had such a large group of people 
begging me to give them a public caning. Uh, some viewers wrote in last week, it really makes me mad that he never bothered to tell people that the lizard hip dinosaurs evolved the bird hip in parallel to the other line of dinosaurs. I've said it before and I'll say it again, this man is willingly leaving out or distorting information, and I beg anyone who sees this video to just check the facts out for themselves. Thanks for writing in, but apparently you missed the point. <laughs> you admit in your comments that the evolutionism myth claims bird hips evolved from lizard hips. Now to change a lizard hip into a bird hip, takes major re-engineering of the structure of the entire organism. Muscles need to be moved, removed, attached elsewhere, along with the major bone changes. Yet you somehow seem to think this outlandish story is more believable if some of the dinosaurs kept their lizard hips. Look, you are welcome to believe the lizard hips kept right on trucking in different organisms, but that, frankly, is quite irrelevant to the discussion of whether or not lizard hips could even evolve into bird hips. That was great. I guess now the evolutionists will want to prove evolution by turning humans into sludge. Good luck to them, LOL. Hmm, is Protoavis a bird? It is very disputable, as is the Jurassic duck. Which, if it was a duck, is not the same as ducks today. But you skip all that unnecessary change rubbish because God said he created everything exactly as it is today. Oh wait, no he didn't. In fact, there is nothing in the Bible which says the slightest thing about the issue, hence why most Christians are clever enough to accept evolution. How you can deny evolution when it is observable is beyond me. Actually, ten times in the first chapter of Genesis alone, it says God created life to reproduce after its kind. Of course, what we actually see in the fossil record lines up with Genesis. We see extinction and stasis. Organisms reproducing faithfully after their kind. This is what is observable. Evolution is not observable, testable, nor repeatable. Vegavis also wrote in about Protoavis. Also, I'm not sure what possesses you to claim that Protoavis is a bird when the majority of paleontologists disagree with Chatterjee's original diagnosis. All that is known for sure is that Protoavis was an archosaur. Next, the Horton Trackway was made by an amphibian, and many Manoraptan dinosaurs, from which birds derive, including Velociraptor, have a posteriorly fa facing pubis, just like modern birds. Thanks for writing in. However, multiple paleontologists, including my good friend Joe Taylor, who actually saw the original Protoavis fossil with his own two eyes, see the fossil as a completely modern bird. Taylor actually lives just outside of Post, Texas, where the fossil was found, and I've actually excavated in those Triassic red beds along with Taylor. Now, when Taylor saw the fossil, he said to Chatterjee, you know, the unbiased person would say that looks just like a blackbird. To which Chatterjee agreed. <laughs> the only reason Protoavis is controversial is because of the rock layers in which it was found are too old for birds. As for the Horton Bluff fossil trackways, you are grossly in error. The original claims describe the track maker as a crocodile-like creature. The Nova Scotia Museum website claims they were made by an amphibian. And in a 2004 GSA paper, Lucas Spencer described the interpretation of the tracks as an embarrassingly bad blunder. He then went on to make his own embarrassing remarks and claimed the tracks were probably made by fish fins. I've personally studied and mapped out the trail. The tracks were clearly made by a bipedal animal with two large toes, a big claw off the tip of the larger toe, and no tail drag evidence anywhere. I compared those footprints to actual ostrich tracks at an ostrich ranch in Alberta, and they are a dead ringer, complete with a claw impression off the tip of the larger toe. Interestingly, the famous Canadian geologist William Logan found fossil bird tracks in that immediate area in 1841. Sternberg mentioned these tracks in more detail in a GSA bulletin of 1933 and said the tracks, quote, superficially resemble the tracks of some of the wading birds, but of course there is little probability of their having been made by birds, end quote. Because as we all know, they can't be bird tracks because birds had not yet evolved in the Carboniferous, right? Ian, that was excellent as always. I had not previously heard that birds are supposed to have evolved from lizard hip dinos, nor of the proof in the fossil record that birds predated dinosaurs, as biblical creationists already knew. That was very informative. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, bro. I have found this very educational. God bless. 
You are doing a great job of dismantling and exposing the Darwin lobby's shenanigans. I take them on every, every now and then. They're slime of the worst sort. Not that I don't love them, but they're nasty little obstinate children who rant and rave against authority that might slap them on the wrist for their misbehavior and Three Stooges mentality. <laughs> P.S. They're drawn to creationist videos like Moths to the Flame. Their large numbers are outweighed by the zapping sound of their demise. Circus of Precision got into a lengthy debate with several YouTubers, making numerous significant points. Now, I hope you don't mind my calling you Precision for short. It was clear that Precision had a pretty wide range of knowledge, and I was pretty impressed with their patience as they tried to explain their points to people who did not want to understand. In response to claims that somehow the letters in the DNA were information, Precision wrote, No, dude, just no. <laughs> you're talking about information carrying capacity, but now you're trying to switch to semantics. These strings of letters are meaningless without the codon conventions. All you're demonstrating is the capacity of the sequence to carry information, completely oblivious to the encoding, transmission, and decoding of the message based upon predetermined arbitrary rules. You are right on the money, Precision. Letters do not equal information. Letters convey information. You need more than letters. You need someone to assemble the letters into information, a system for conveying the information, a system for reading the information, and a system for using the information, as Precision pointed out, based on predetermined arbitrary rules. A simile would be someone speaking Arabic to someone who speaks and understands only English. <laughs> Loads of information there, but they are operating on different rules to convey information, and the information is lost and unusable because of the system breakdown. The incredible systems involved in life that use the information in the DNA are staggering in their complexity and necessary to read the information in the DNA. But the information on how to build those systems necessary to read information in the DNA comes from the information conveyed by the DNA. <laughs> it's a codependent system. As we can see in the comments left against precision by those who refused to understand, one can truly say that there is none so blind as those who will not see. The comments were just as shocking to follow as the story of Jesus healing the blind man from birth and the reaction of those who did not want to believe in Christ. You can see why Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world that they would see not might see, and that they would see might be made blind. Precision, I don't know who you are, but for your valiant efforts in the intellectual battle, I salute you. Well, that's it for this week's show. Thanks for watching and ranting. Please click share down below and share this program with your friends on TwitFace Plus and subscribe up top. Remember the words of Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. See you next Thursday.